Um, we're now going to receive our tithes and offerings. So if I could get 2 Samuel 6, verses 11 through 12, put up on the screen. It says this, it says, The ark of the Lord remained there in Obed-Edom's house for three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and his entire household. Then King David was told, The Lord has blessed Obed-Edom's household and everything he has because the ark of God. So David went there and brought the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with a great celebration. Psalm 89, 15 says, Blessed are those who have learned to acclaim you, who walk in the light of your presence, Lord. You know, that verse out of 2 Samuel is remarkable. And David was bringing the ark to Jerusalem. And you guys probably remember this story. They brought it on a cart rather than carrying it on poles. And, and Uzzah reached out to steady the ark. And the Lord, because he touched the ark of God, he, he died in God's presence. And David was fearful and left the ark at Obed-Edom's house. And it says that just having the ark of God in Obed-Edom's house, that man and his entire household was blessed. Because the presence of God was in his house. There was a blessing that, that immediately came upon Obed-Edom and his entire household. And you know, back then, where the presence of God was regulated to the ark, Obed-Edom won the jackpot, so to speak, right? He really did. He won the jackpot. He got the presence of God in his home for three months, and his entire household was blessed. But we, as New Covenant believers, we can enter into the very presence of God everywhere we go, every day. And we all have that, that opportunity to, to have the presence of God in us and with us everywhere we go and living that blessed life in every facet. So I just wanted to encourage us with that tonight. We're gonna receive our offering. So I'm gonna invite the ushers to come forward. You guys can take out what you've purposed to give to the Lord. I'm gonna pray over the offering. Father, we just thank you for your abiding presence. Lord, we thank you that, Lord, that we can all be like Obed-Edom. We can all live in that place of your presence and live in that place of having our entire life and our household blessed by you. So Lord, we, we take even this opportunity, Lord, of giving in our, of our tithes, our offerings, our first fruits to you and your kingdom, Lord, and we recognize we do so from a place of your presence. We do so from a place of being blessed already, blessed by you. And Lord, we're thankful, we're grateful. And God, we just ask that you would continue to reveal yourself to each of us. Lord, this week, more than ever before, in Jesus' name, amen. And you guys can give to the Lord. Hello, Life Bible Church family. Thank you so much for your continued faithfulness to give. There are two different ways you can give. You can go to our website, lifebiblechurch.org, and give there, or you can simply mail your check here to the church to the address on the screen. Thank you again so much. And now, back to the service. All right. Let's pray. Jesus, I want to thank you so much for your presence tonight. I want to thank you that you're an amazing God. Lord, that you do marvelous things. You're full of wonder and awe. Lord, you're faithful to your word. God, I'm going to ask you to help us with our preconceived perceptions, things that we've thought we understood, but Lord, there's so much more that's there. All of it has been contained in your scriptures. God, I'm asking you to reveal tonight through shedding light, your light, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth upon your word. Give us your presence tonight. Feed us fresh bread. In your presence is fullness of joy. We love you. Everyone said, amen. 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 Let's greetings, everyone, in the name of the Lord. <laughs> Revelation 11, here we go. Revelation 11, then I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and an angel stood saying, Rise, measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. But leave out the court 
which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given, <clears throat> excuse me, to the Gentiles, for they shall tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. <coughs> excuse me. And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. For these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before God of the earth. All right, we've already prayed. I've taken up too much time, so I'm not going to do current events. We'll bring them forward next week. Um, Let's jump into the notes because we got one page last week. We got to do a little better. Hallelujah. You should be on page two. Is that correct? Page two of your notes? Well, yes, some of you have paid, yeah, whatever it is. It's second page page of part two. Okay, thank you. (laughs) You're killing, thank you, thank you, Petey, thank you. Uh, I'm messing with you, brilliant senator. Um, So let's talk about, I think we said it last week, there is a divine standard. I think I said that on Sunday. Really, I got what I was doing on Sunday. I, I, I pulled that from this class because it was so impactful to me while I was preaching it. On till we all come to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, Ephesians 4, 12, and 13, to the mature manhood, to the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's the measure. That's the divine measure. And when the Bible says, go ahead and measure the altar, right? Rise and measure the temple, the altar, and those who worship there. That's the divine standard. And that's why I think I wanted to share that story with you uh, as we had our preamble. Uh, For those that are watching, we did a little private preamble here with our own church. It's because there is a divine measurement for those who worship in the inner part. We shouldn't act like those who worship in the outer court. We have a total different mindset about who we are, about the authority that we've been given, and about the sacredness and the trust that moves us from just having an understanding of Jesus dying for sin and then an understanding of partnership and living in fellowship in a holy form of living life as a minister. And I don't mean minister as in paid, I mean minister as in to God and his delegated authority. There's a big difference. Outer court mentality versus inner court mentality. Two different things. And the Bible in Revelation gets to it here. He said, one, I want you to measure the temple. I want you to measure the altar. And I want you to measure those who worship there. The other, I don't want you to measure. I want you to leave it alone. There's no measurement. If if you're going to get anything from Revelation 11 before we get into the two witnesses, that is what you need to take to it. Why? Because if you're going to go in the inner temple, you are connected to that altar. It's not just the Holy Spirit. Please hear me. Charismatic Pentecostals are notorious for this. Wanting illumination and understanding, but don't want to actually go to the altar of incense. They want bread of presence, and they want illumination and revelation, but they will not stand, which was the whole point of leading in, is stand and intercede spending time in prayer, lifting and bringing the burden of the Lord for breakthrough because of the presence. A lot of times we just want understanding and illumination. We want to get our bread for us and get our presence and then we go our way. Well, there's there's a measure of that, but that altar of incense is part of our responsibility. Nobody else gets that. The altar of incense is about bringing the sacrifice of Jesus that's in the outer court and putting those coals on that altar, being grateful, sacrifice of the blood, but then recognize because of the blood the sacred responsibility to actually put yourself as a person in the gap and intercede. And that's where, if I'm just to say where I feel moved prophetically tonight, 
and why I gave you that preamble, I feel prophetically tonight, God gave me a, just a picture and a window that that is the season the church has to move into. It's now becoming a season where we're going to have to embrace the altar of incense. The altar of incense becomes, if you will, that last piece of furniture before full breakthrough. I mean, we know we get the presence of Jesus. I'm not, I'm not relegating us to an old temple. I'm talking type and shadow here. We know we have the presence of Jesus who is the ark himself. He's the ark of the covenant. He's the, he's the, he's the very presence. The veil has been torn. But the altar of incense here in Revelation 11 is in the spirit. It is, there was no physical temple on the earth. This is in the spirit. And in the spirit, we're dealing with the atmosphere of what burning incense, not physically, spiritually, offering ourselves, and remember, this is what spiritual sacrifice is, presenting yourself as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, offering the calves or the burnt offerings of your lips and of your hands, like the morning and the evening sacrifice, so is the lifting of my hands and the calves of my lips. In that expression of worship, it is also then bringing the needs of the people before the Father, just like Jesus did. If we become one with him, we're now ministering with him in oneness of prayer. Are, are, are we there? Okay, just, just so we're, we're there. So, there's a measuring of the worshipers. The Apostle John is told to measure those who worship there. Temple, altar, worship. Temple is measured in a collective perspective. The altar is measured, includes both the individual and the corporate experience, the thought being in the realm of prayer, supplication, and intercession. Worshippers being measured then is more of an individual response. So you have really three things that the Holy Spirit is highlighting here. We're going to measure the corporate spot response to prayer. We're going to measure intercession, corporate, both corporate and individual. And we're going to measure the person. So it's like, how are we made? Body, soul, and spirit? Well, in the atmosphere here is we're going to now measure the whole church body, soul, and spirit that incorporates all of it, so to speak, dealing with it. Now, I've told you I don't believe this is a material temple or a material altar of incense, so who can these worshipers be? The language here is inapplicable to those who are Jewish or, for that matter of fact, unregenerate, unregenerate Gentiles. The only worshipers that can be measured here that God is now accepting, that he tells us in John 4, right, is those who worship him must worship him in what? Spirit and in truth. Spirit and in truth. Jesus repudiated the literal temple and the earthly sites, spoke to the woman at the well about this. Jesus told her her hour was coming, and he said, and now is, when neither in Jerusalem or Samaria would the location nor the worship be offered there would be acceptable to the Father. So the Father is seeking those now who are true worshipers. Those that would worship him must do so in spirit and in truth. Worship carried out and under the older form in a material temple with man's hands is not what the Father is after. So, <clears throat> Proverbs 15, 8 and 9, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is acceptable. The way of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the Lord loves him who pursues righteousness. True and genuine real worshipers are those who worship God through Jesus Christ. And Christ, God has set his seal against material temples, altars, and formal hypocritical worship. He will not go back to what he has forsaken and abolished. One of the reasons we know that is the language that is used here. The Greek language has two words for the word temple. The first word is heron, which speaks of that which is a sacred priestly edifice or a temple proper, a temple to do priestly service of worship. That's heron. 
and refi it belongs to a material temple. Matthew 21, verse 12, uses that word, that Greek word, hieron, in the Greek for the word temple. But the Greek word here in Revelation 11, 1 and 2 is the word naos, which means a dwelling place, an inner sanctuary. It does not reference an actual physical edifice. It actually represents, in the Greek language, it represents the dwelling place, the inner sanctuary. So when he says, rise and measure the temple, what's he saying? In the spirit, God is going to measure the inner dwelling place of every believer where they are at with God in their temple at the altar and them personally. It's a measuring of the people. It's not a measuring of the actual temple. It's a measuring of the people of how they stand before the Lord. It's the difference between Naos and Hiram. Does that make sense? So when we go to Revelation 11 and it opens with the temple on earth and closes with the temple opened in heaven, the true temple in, in earth is the church and the shadow of the true temple that is in heaven. Right? Okay. Let's, let's, let's keep going on it so you understand it. The church individually and corporately now is the temple which will measure up to the standard of God's word as one, his habitation, and two, his prayer ministry, and three, worshipers in spirit and truth. How do we know that? First Peter 4, 17 and 18. If a material temple is being spoken of, then God will still only accept worship that comes from regenerative hearts. But the New Testament is clear that God doesn't deal with material temples, nor does he accept literal incense anymore from material buildings. He only accepts worship from a heart that is true to him in spirit. So God is saying what? The church, God's temple, must measure up to the divine word, the standard. Two, the prayers of the saints as the altar of incense must measure up to the ministry that he has shown it that is its ministry to uphold. Third, true worshipers, the saints, must measure up to what? Worshiping in spirit and in truth. <clears throat> all right, we okay with that? Verse two, that was all on, ver we did all of those last weeks for verse one. Here we go, verse two. But do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it is given to the nations, and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. <clears throat> Leave out the court which is outside the temple and do not measure it. This is a very significant part of John's vision. And we need to look at two things. Number one, the temple, the altar, and the worshipers are all measured. The outer court, however, of the temple, still of something, it's not measured. The outer court is distinguished from the Greek word temple, naos, itself. It is without or outside the temple. Or it is a court related to the temple but it is not part of the temple as it is outside the temple. So it'd be like having a basketball court outside a gymnasium. It's, the court isn't inside the gymnasium, but there is a court also outside the gymnasium. It's still called part of the basketball courts, but it's not an inner court, it's an outer court. Okay, are you doing okay? <clears throat> the, the Apostle John would have been familiar with this type of language. For us, it might seem a little bit strange, but for him, he would have understood the outer courts because the tabernacle of Moses had an outer court measuring 100 by 50 cubits, Exodus 27, 9 through 19. 
the temple of Solomon had its particular outer court, 1 Chronicles 28, 12. The temple of Herod also had several outer courts. There were the courts for the priests, the courts for Israel, the courts for Jews, the courts for women, and the courts for the Gentiles. That was all division as part of the temple complex. <clears throat> so in the temple and the temple courts were where? The brazen altar and the brazen laver were in the temple courts. They were made of brass. We talked about this early on in chapter 1 and <laughs> three years ago, and I know you remember that lesson like we just taught it yesterday, right? Uh, but the fact of the matter is, brass always speaks to what? Judgment. Always. Brass is always, the sim gold always represents what? Represents that it's been purified, it's pure, right? It represents, the Bible says, your faith, which is more precious than gold, right? The testing of your faith is more precious than gold. Silver represents what? The power of sanctification. It represents redemption. Brass always represents judgment. So, why did Moses' tabernacle, why did Solomon's temple have brazen altar and brazen labor? Is because sin had to be dealt with. The two ways sin was dealt with was what? First by blood and then by water. Same thing that happens to you today in the New Testament. How is sin dealt with with you? First by blood, then by water. Meaning what? The water, I'm going to explain. The water of the word. So it's the blood of Jesus Christ, which no other one can be shed. It's his blood. But then it's also no other word but his that cleanses you. That's why in Ephesians 5 he says he washes you by the water of his word. So the judgment against sin is done in the outer court. It's why Romans could say, Paul would say in Romans, he said, the handwriting that was against you has been nailed to the cross of Christ. The sin judgment, remember when Paul said the strength of sin in 1 Corinthians 15, the strength of sin <clears throat> is the law. Meaning because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, it means that sin's strength is in broken law. So let me say that again. Sin's strength is in broken law. How do I, how, how do I explain this? Let's see. So give me your hand for a second. I've got a tough ombre here. So broken law means at some point, let's say, I'm going to represent the sinner. She's going to represent the law for a second. Or she's going to represent sin. <laughs> if I violate the law of God, okay, so let's just, let's just deal with the Ten Commandments. Okay, thou shalt not covet. And I covet something, and I want it. And I, I go to pursue something that hasn't been given to me. Okay. Now because of broken law, Sin has a right to grab on to me. Okay, you're grabbing on. Are you grabbing on tight? Yeah. I, I don't, don't feel very tight. Okay, <laughs> and, and now its strength, because it's a powerful grip, I can wail like a marlin coming up out of that boat. But the reality is broken law gives sin its power to stay a hold of me unless something more powerful comes along. And the only thing more powerful than that is the blood of Jesus Christ when it's confessed that breaks the release of the power of the strength of sin. Okay, that's why judgment is dealt with in the outer court because your sin has such power it can only be dealt with with blood. Old Testament, it was an animal. It put it off for a year for the nation. But if you kept sinning as a person, you had to keep bringing another animal. Let me tell you something. If you had an addiction, you went through your herd awful fast, you were broken, you sold yourself into slavery, then you didn't have a chance to have an addiction. 
moving on. Right? It's the blood of Jesus that brought the judgment against sin that God said sin had to be dealt with with blood, innocent blood. So when we get to that outer court, that's what that, that truth is. The outer court was a place of what? Sacrifice. The outer court in the Old Testament was a place of sacrifice. The outer court in the Spirit in the New Testament in, in God's court is still a place of sacrifice. Guess where he died? Outside the city. <laughs> we, go, we, didn't, we don't come, no, notice, they didn't come into Jerusalem to receive in the city proper temple to receive the sacrifice. It was outside the city he was made a reproach. The outer courts, the outer reaches of Jerusalem. Are you there? It's important. So the outer court was the place of sacrifice. That's your fill-in. And here in the Apostle John's vision, the outer court, all those in the outer court area are left what? Unmeasured. They're not measured by the divine standard. They're they're measured by the place of sacrifice. Let's go here. The fact that the company of people in the outer court failed to measure up to the divine standard of the measuring rod means that those in the temple were measured up qualified for priestly ministry. Here's where I said last week, and I think there was a little bit of people not sure of the semantics. I said this is where we're divided into two camps. The trampling down and the place of the outer court still means there is salvation. But it doesn't mean they're walking in the ministry of the salvation that they were destined for. Let me say that again. Over here, what gets trampled down for 42 months still has the power to be redeemed because of the blood and the, and the ministry of the blood of a judgment over sin. Over here, the divine standard are those who understand their inheritance and allow the word of God to be over their life and are actually walking in the ministry of what they were called to live up and grow into the divine standard of Christ. Can I say it this way? thief on the cross here apostles over here just to make it an easy thief on the cross Jesus said what today you'll be with me in paradise but how many know he got trampled he didn't pull him off the cross he still had his legs broken by the centurion after suffering for six to eight hours because of the day of preparation the thief died a a death both of them did but one went to heaven The other, one was taken, the other was not. All the apostles lost their life except for one. But all of them ministered in the, except for the son of perdition, ministered in the aspect of spirit anointing, bread of his presence, fellowship, and in the altar of incense. And so did many, many Christians. They were what? Measured by the divine standard, lived in the divine standard, understood that there were promises and principles to apprehend because of that ministry and that partnership. They're still available for those over here, but these didn't want that or didn't choose that, but they were least in the court. Are you, are you there? Okay, that's where I'm saying, perspective-wise, two camps of Christianity exist in Revelation 11. <clears throat> yes, sir. As we go forward, that, what you just said is really going to help, right? In answering the question, why does Revelation 13, 1 talk about Christians when we just had a whole chapter on Revelation 12 of Christians being protected versus being war? Outer court, 13-1, inner court, 12. That's 
why he's the professor. There you go. Uh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> he said, okay, let me say it this way. Revelation 13, 1 talks about Christians. Revelation 12 talks about Christians being protected for time, time, and half a time. Same time frame as the outer court is being trampled. We have one group of Christians getting protected for time, time, and half a time. We have another group that's experiencing tribulation for time, time, and half a time. And so what they all try to do is they try to sum it up and saying, well, the church is out. This is more about Jews, and we're going to go. This is the, the split of the three and a half year and the three and a half year with the Jew. I wouldn't see it that way. I would see it's Jew and Gentile both, those that are measured by the divine standard and those that are not. Big difference. Yeah, the virgins. The five foolish and the five wise. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's good. I, I would say another, another thought that might just tweak your classic understanding is, is when it says one will be taken, two will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken, the other will be left. Two will be in bed, one will be taken, the other will be left. Could that be he's talking about Christians there and not unbelievers, that one would be taken and protected and one would be left? Could be. We'll find out. I'm just saying something for you to ponder if you've, if you've considered the classic interpretation that it was an unbeliever that's taken versus how about the Christian that's taken and protected, preserved, given the wings of an eagle for time, time, and half a time. How does that happen? Well, potentially understanding praying in the Spirit and in truth, God knows how to move people by the Spirit at that time. Philip knows a little bit of something about that. Moving on. All right. So let's talk about the points to the overcomer, non-overcomers here. Okay? So, I mean, it's not a great thing, but the outer court unmeasured is sick is significant then of believers, here's your fill in, who did not measure up to the measure of Christ to be required in the temple company or what some people call the bride company of God's people who do measure up. See, that creates the great debate here is everybody the bride of Christ? Now I know I'm maybe throwing some new concepts on you here that you've thought maybe everybody's the bride of Christ. I want to suggest to you that potentially that might not be the case. It doesn't mean that you won't be saved. But if you didn't measure up to the divine standard, it kind of also ties in with what we talked about, the 144,000. It doesn't mean it's just 144,000. It means those that were what? Measured up to the selection process of what the Lord did out of his companies of people. Doesn't mean that you won't get to heaven, and it doesn't mean that you are in outer darkness. It just means those of who chose to yield their lives at a certain level Yes, Karen. Yep. Right. And that's what I'm saying. There's there's scripture to 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 mitigate all of these potential caveats. I'm just kind of dropping on you today some what ifs because remember, I'm not saying to you this is what what you should firmly believe. I am saying to you, we are going through this to begin to open your understanding 
a little bit to be able to widen it up a bit and go, okay, here's the classic interpretations that maybe you were raised with. But what if you look at the scriptures from this view? It totally changes the emphasis. Okay? So, the non-overcomers then, what do, we, what do we know? Well, we know that if it points to the non-overcomers out of the seven churches in the book of Revelation, it speaks to those who fail to measure up because they what? They either what? Number one, left their first love and didn't repent. Two, believed in a false doctrine and kept that false doctrine. Three, operated in spiritual deadness and didn't repent. Four, were operating in spiritual harlotry. Five, were operating in lukewarmness. These were the five things out of the seven churches. Two had no warning of what to repent of. That was, right, Philadelphia and, um, oh, Turkey. Anyways, one of the others. Huh? That other one, yeah. Uh, but five of the seven had strict warnings from Jesus, unless you repent, I'm going to remove my lampstand. Where's the lampstand? Oh, shakalabakala. Over here. In the what? The ministry of priesthood. Over here in the ministry of the altar of incense and communion with the presence of Christ. He didn't say, I'm going to throw you out of my kingdom. Now, I'm, 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 I'm supposing a few things. I'm not, there's some things that need to be brought up, but I'm not, I, I don't have time tonight. But you need to understand we have to be consistent with the interpretation of the language. You can't have lampstand language in Revelation 1, 2, and 3, and then all of a sudden change the definition of lampstand in Revelation 11. Lampstand has to be consistent. So if he says, I walk among the lampstand, which represents the church, which represents the picture of illuminated people that have the word that are operating in presence and fresh revelation, I'll remove the lampstand. What does that leave you? That leaves you religion and maybe a belief in just the blood of Jesus, but you don't move into any part of living in the spirit. You just have a remnant of truth. Are, are you there? So it's a pretty big deal when we come down here to Revelation 11 where we see potentially the great divide. It's, can I say this? It's easy to put it all on the rapture and say this is all now just a Jewish thing. If you're Gentile, forget about it. Right? Because then you don't have to be responsible for anything. You get a good version of Western Christianity. You're in heaven. You're selecting tea times. You're riding your favorite horse. You know, you're, you're doing all the things that people think they're going to do in heaven. And you're just leaving it all down here for the remnant of Israel to deal with. I don't think I can buy that. Personally. I think it's Jewish and Gen to the Jew first and the Gentile of a redeemed operating in priestly ministry at the altar in front of the candlestick the rep, what it represents and the table living in fellowship in truth and the spirit presenting my body as a living sacrifice just like the priests that were ordained to live that they were God's portion he picked them to serve the whole nation now that same call is for all the nation of God's people but it's now a choice Old Testament, it was his selection of one of the 12 tribes. New Testament is, it's all the tribes, spiritually Jew and Gentile, have that right to live in that place. But some choose it and some don't. You okay? All right. No, we're in, the, we're in some hot habanero sauce here. Here we go. Okay. Revelation 11.2. But do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it is given to the nations. They will trample the holy city for 42 months. 
This word leave out is an amazing word. Are you ready for this? Do not measure it. It is the word ekbalo. Ekbalo is what I just did today. It is cast out. It means, ek, ek um, means <laughs> to eject, uh, to e balo means to eject, so ek, to throw out, to pick up and remove, to leave, the best way to, to leave. So when you're, when, when I'm speaking something, leave in Jesus' name, I am commanding ekbalo. Okay? To expel, to leave, to pluck, to thrust out, to send away. The expression leave out is literally the word cast out, throw out. Throw out the outer court. Don't measure it. The expression adds much weight to truth here when you think cast out the outer court. The saints of the outer court are left unmeasured. If they're left unmeasured, they're cast out of something. Let's say it that way. If you're not measured, you're cast out of something of where you're supposed to be measured. Okay, it's 810. Let's take a look at some of this. It means that the ones in the outer court are left out, cast out. The judgment that is given here is to what? Be trampled by the nations. Have you ever wondered why it's strange that when you begin to read Revelation 14 and 15, especially 14, it says, and then judgment will be made against the saints and the beast will fight against the saints? Trampled by the nations. Doesn't mean that they're law, it could mean Let's, let's, look at, let's look at the cast out because the cast out has quite a few references in the New Testament. The children of the kingdom without faith, the Bible says in Matthew 8, 12, will be cast into outer darkness. The man without the wedding garment in Matthew 22, 1 through 14 was cast out into outer darkness. Same words. The unprofitable servant who did not do what his master asked him, was cast out into outer darkness. The savorless salt that lost its flavor was cast out and trodden under foot of men, Matthew 5, 13. That's probably the one that is almost a, almost a direct parallel here. What happens when salt loses its flavor? Well, it's still technically salt, but it's not doing what it was designed to do but it didn't all of a sudden become pepper. Right? You were salt, but you lost your power to actually do what salt does. Salt does what? Preserve. Salt enhances. Salt brings the, in the words of emerald, bam, brings the bam to the foo, right? That's what salt does, right? Okay. If you've lost, it wicks, it draws. I mean, it has medicinal purposes. It has all sorts of things. But if it loses that flavor, what's it good for? It says it's not even good for the manure pile. It doesn't actually, it doesn't, salt on the manure pile does what? It at least works in the bacteria and gets it to dissolve the manure so that it doesn't have quite the stench. He said it's not even fit for the manure pile. It's cast out, but it's still salt. Jesus cast the money changers out of the temple. The unwise virgins are left outside the door of marriage because of the lack of oil. And the tares and the evil fish are also cast into the furnace of fire. All of these illustrations are illustrations potentially of a company of people of outer court believers who do not measure up and are cast forth or cast out. 
Whew. Each parable of Christ, finishing with this, on outer darkness, in my opinion, was spoken of believers. Outer darkness parables correspond to outer court unmeasured ones. That's your fill-in. Outer darkness parables correspond to outer court unmeasured ones. Each parable is telling the same truth under different pictures using different symbols. They become typical of one another of the same thing. In the parables of outer darkness, it is worthy of note mention, noteworthy of mention that most of the houses of Jerusalem had courts surrounding their house in which an unprofitable servant would have been cast out during times of fasting. Didn't throw them out into the city, into the, into the absolute past, but cast them out of the inner place to an outer place that was still connected. So, I'm going to leave you with that. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you tonight. I pray that what was shared would stir and, Lord, just begin to move inside of us. Lord, we would look at the scriptures, not to change, Lord, or somehow trade something, but see how you and your scriptures have such a, an amazing purview that we could look at it from a different angle. Help us see the light on these scriptures. Help us understand the correlation of looking of how, Lord, we might interpret this chapter 11 and see a possible fresh understanding for our own perspective. I ask that you be with your people tonight. Bring them back to the National Day of Prayer. Bring them back to the Women's Conference. And bring them back to the weekend services. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you all. Have a great evening. <laughs>